Yeah. All right, folks, we'll get rolling again. Um, I don't have a ton of uh, slides, but I wanted to give you a bit of an update on some of the projects we did with the seed working group this year. Uh, I've got, uh, you know, probably about 20 minutes of slides, I guess. Um, same as always, if you got any questions or comments as we go along, fire away. Um, I put a picture of a very scabby tuber up here. This is from 2020, from one of the trials we did. Uh, and uh, one of the projects we looked at this year was on common scab reduction. So, uh, anybody in here used serenade soil before? One, two, couple? Okay. So, serenade soil is an inferral biological fungicide. It's primarily used for uh, rhizoctonia, but it's also labeled for pythium and link rot, pick rot and fusarium root rot. There's a new formulation of it out now from Bayer and it's called Minuet instead of serenade soil. So last year was the first year for this new formulation. Um, I wouldn't say there's a lot of people PEI yeah, using it, but there'd be some. Um, as I say, maybe instead of quadris or in addition to quadris for rhizoc control. Um, but in Manitoba, as part of the last uh, big national cluster project, they had a project on SCAD and they were able to see some level of effectiveness uh, on reducing common SCAD uh, using serenade soil. So uh, Claudia Goyer from Ag Canada and Fredericton presented on this last, last winter at the potato conference in Summerside. So we said, okay, well that's a relatively easy trial to set up here. Let's try and see if we can so what would we see under PEI conditions, our varieties, <coughs> uh, our scab populations, that sort of thing. So we did three field trials uh, this year through AIM. Uh, we did one uh, at Andrew Lawless's on Ranger Russets. We did another one uh, up at Jonathan's on Rangers for Seed. And we did one with Brandon uh, McPhail on Kennebex. So all, seed, all susceptible varieties. Uh, basically, they're split, split field trials. So a jug of minuet does about 10 acres. So we would do like 10 acres with and 10 acres without. And no other changes to the fungicide program or the or the crop protection program. And then we did harvest samples, which we graded for yield as well as for uh, tuber skin blemishes. So Rick Peters' team at Ag Canada worked with us, and we did uh, I think uh, 25 tubers per uh, sample for we did six samples in each rep. 25 tubers per sample, so we'd have 150 tubers per, per uh, treatment, and that would give us an idea on what actual level of scab are we seeing on the, on the potatoes. And we actually, we scored some of the other things like Rhizoc and Silver Skirt as well. Newton also uh, did this on a plot scale uh, at the research farm in New Annan, and then Rick did it on his sort of scab nursery plot at uh, Harrington as well. So we'll have this on a plot scale as well as on a field scale. So you may not be able to see all the numbers, I'll talk about as, uh, as we go along. This was from the Ranger Seed up at Dup West. Uh, long story short, we saw no difference in uh, yield. Actually, Jonathan did the check. Uh, he did minuet, but he also did what he normally does on a lot of crops, on a lot of his crops is this Microflora Pro, which is he also is using for skin finish and scab reduction. Um, so we saw no statistical difference on yield um, or on size and quality, that sort of thing. And on scab, we actually surprisingly saw a slight increase in scab with the minuet uh, over the check. But I should say uh, the overall level of scab was quite low in the field uh, and this was fairly late planted stuff. Um, but we really did not see much in the way of skin blemish, skin problems at all in this field. Um, so. Sometimes if you, if you have a lot of tubers with zero on it, um, even in, in both, and in both, and you can see that right here, we had a lot of it, a lot of tubers that either had zero or one percent scab. So when you get a lot of zeros, even if there there's a bunch that are at one, it might say there's statistical significance, even though the difference between zero and one is so low, right? So um, you know, you can see as we go up to five and 10 and 15 percent, there was a little bit more in the minuet than in the check at the five and ten percent but um we're still talking a pretty a pretty low levels of scab here now on rangers at andrews again there was no difference in yield uh no difference in size and yield like all these are very non-significant um but when we got to tuber blemishes 
um, there was a statistical difference. The it was about a 60% reduction in scab uh, from the minuet to the check. And, and, it was, and in the severity, they also scored them for the amount of scab on the tuber, but also the severity, like did they see pitted scab or, or like, you know, a scab that would be a, a, big, a big issue to deal with. So this kind of tells the story a little more. If you look at, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30% in the minuet, there's a lot fewer of the, of the higher coverage potatoes than in the check. And you can see there's more, there's about uh, 30 more per, per sample uh, that were zero as opposed to the check. So we did see a noticeable trend here. And then what's interesting is we saw pretty much exactly the same trend at uh, Brandon's. So again, it's about 60, 65% reduction in scab percentage. Um, again, no difference in yield, no difference at all. Um, so again we see this trend and like th this was the field with the most scab these were Kennebex and you can see like even in the check we've got 20 25 30 35 40 percent coverage on potatoes whereas in the minuet we kind of top out at about 15 percent so it does look like there was some level of beneficial effect on this at least on these two fields so we saw a similar level on two fields we had one field that didn't have the same that's the nature of field trials. <laughs> so we're, I'm not willing to hang a hat on this yet and say, you know, by, we all know scab research is, is fickle and funny uh, and different people have different strains of scab and response to different things, but it's definitely enough to warrant another year of trials for sure. Um, so we're planning on doing another couple of years of trials on this. We'll probably branch out in a couple more, probably do some Alverstones and prospects in them. We know those are varieties that can also get scab. So we'll, we'll do a little bit of work on that this year. Um, some of the people that did it last year are interested in doing it again, but if there's anybody in particular that's grown one of these varieties and wants to do it on, pro, on processing acres, let me know. We're also, I'm waiting on data from Ag Canada and Cavendish to, to sort of see what they saw at the plot scale. I think Newton will probably have some data from, uh, to share at his day in next month in March. Um, but uh, good. In this case, it's good to do it both at the plot scale and the field scale and kind of see what we see. Um, so yeah, we're, this was the first year of this work. We're going to do it again another year. And then hopefully, if we have two or three years data, then we understand whether it's got, you know, what kind of potential it's got um, and what kind of recommendation we can make to growers. Serenade soil last year was about $25 an acre. So I don't know whether it'll change much in, in pricing, but yeah, it's about 250 bucks a jug. Uh, something like that and just those 10 acres so that's the sort of the gist any questions about this thoughts as i said one year trial so more more story to be told um aphid resistance to insecticides so uh sophie was just talking about the increasing challenge they're seeing with aphids we're seeing that too um We've been, we know that 2022 was a really poor year uh, for seed pass rate and for virus levels. And we also saw big levels of aphids. And what we've seen the last two years now is this big population of green peach aphids coming in in uh, July, August, uh, and then spiking late August, early September. And that's got a real, uh, we know that green peach aphids are probably the most, uh, the worst transmitter of virus in potatoes, like it's it's a colonizing aphid, and it actually like is a preferred uh, transmitter of PVY and leaf roll uh, into potatoes. So, and we've gone through three or four years where we very saw almost none or no green peach aphids, right? So, uh, but then 2022 they came in with a vengeance, uh, and then this year we saw them as well. What we also saw in 2015-2016 in the ACS lab over in New Brunswick, so that's Matresh's and Tyler's lab over there, they sh did see some indications of resistance to pyrethroid insecticides uh, in green peach aphids particularly. They were seeing like 60-70% levels of mutation <coughs> that would indicate resistance. So we wanted to see what we would, you know, are we seeing that in PEI aphids? Uh, are we seeing it in both green peach aphids and other aphids? So we did this little bit of a trial. So uh, we saved, uh, we worked with the department 
and they had saved all the aphids from the aphid alert program uh, in 2022, <coughs> and then we sent those over to ACS, and then they took a subsample from every week uh, to, to like they took about 20, 25 aphids from every week to try and understand what we saw in terms of levels of mutation across the season. This is a graph of uh, the aphids that we saw from the aphid alert program from 21 to 23. 21 is the solid blue bar. So you can see 2021, not a bad virus year, low virus year, very low levels of aphids through the whole year, a little bit of a blip around, this is like late August, but even that blip is only, you know, two, three aphids per trap, so pretty low. Um, 2022, so the other aphids is the dashed gray line, and you can see they start high right from the get-go, and we're up around seven, eight aphids per trap. They decline slightly, but they stay high early, and that's probably one reason we got into some uh, PDUI troubles. But then those eight other aphids die off a bit by late August, and then we get this massive spike, which is the dashed orange line of green peach aphids. And they go like there's low levels of them in late August and then early September. This is actually off the scale. Like this goes to 40. The number was actually 90, 95 per trap. So uh, huge, huge numbers. Um, and we think that late season spread was a big reason we had an issue with uh, virus last year. This year, we had, didn't not. So the other aphids this year is the dashed blue line. So you can see. It was very similar to 2021. It stayed pretty low through the season. Round, most of the season was around one aphid per trap. Is kind of where we saw it. between about 0.7 and 0.13 aphids per trap um, through the year, increasing a bit as we got late in the season. But again, we saw this jump up at the same time of year in green peach aphids. And this year, we actually saw, started seeing green peach aphids in PEI in July. Now in July, it was only one here and two there and that sort of stuff they were starting to show up but then the, the spike started a week earlier and then they they didn't go as high as 2022 they topped out at about 37 38 per trap and especially west prince was they had a lot of them in west prince so you can see the last few years we had this big late influx of creepy jacobs so we tested about 20 aphids per week over the whole length of the growing season 46% of the total aphids we did in the whole project had at least one resistance marker for resistance. And 100% of the aphids in the last two weeks were resistant, which, and we know, almost all of the aphids in the last two weeks were green peach aphids. This is the to the pyrethroid insecticide, yeah. Group three insecticides. So 94% of the positive aphids were green peach aphid but we did have some other aphids that were positive as well. This is how it graphs out. So first week, none, no, no positive. Uh, it goes up to about 20, 25% but in early, early mid-June. We actually, in this is before we have any green peach aphids and we're up to 45%. Now again, that could be just the 20 we pulled out or whatever, but we are seeing some level of resistance even in those early aphids, which we didn't know that we were really seeing. Then it bottoms out again for a while. So again, early August when there's very few green peach aphids or there's only one or two, there's a little bit of resistance. Or, and all this level of resistance is mostly those early green peach aphids. And then once we get up to the spike of green peach aphids, we're up to 89, 100% resistance. 100% of the green peach aphids that they tested were resistant to pyrethroids. So, these are the pyrethroid insecticides, Matador, Thesis, Silencer, these perm, pounce, per, pounce, perm up, ambush. I don't know if anybody's really using these too much, but I know people are using these three. Basically, these three uh, are not doing anything against green peach aphids at all, and they may not be doing very much against some of the other early aphids now too, which we didn't really know. So the recommendation is really you know, definitely don't use these after about the middle of July, but even early season, you may have maybe more interesting to look at some of your other options and see how you can mix and match. But late season, these are not doing anything for you. So what do you have for other options? And what's the strategy is always, 
ensure a mix of chemistries. Because right now, we also don't know for sure whether there's any resistance in any of these groups. There might be. So your goal, your key is, is not to get too reliant on stuff from one group. Thankfully, we have some different groups here. So your group fours, that's your clutch and your closer, a sail, Savanto prime. I know some of those are getting used on farms here. Group 29 is belief. Group 23 is movento. Group nine is Safina, that's kind of more of a newer one. Um, Viego is, has suppression of aphids on the label. It's mostly used as a, for potato beetle. Um, I wouldn't, you might get some benefit on the aphids, but it's not a true aphicide the way the others are. Uh, but if you have it in the mix for Colorado escapes or something like that, you might be getting some benefit. But it's a little different group as well. So my key, that my key take home here is just, you know, as you're planning your insecticide program, it's about, you know, not getting too reliant on one chemistry and trying to rotate those chemistries as much as you can. And pyrethroids, maybe group threes, maybe early in the season, but definitely not late in the season. So, um, the other part of that is that the green peak of the green peach aphids, again, it's been hitting, we're seeing them show up in small amounts, even in late July. In, in Maine, they started showing up in June. So they're getting earlier and earlier as we get warmer and warmer years. And this year too, um, all those green peach aphids, they come in, right? They don't overwinter in PEI, they come in. So they come in mostly from the eastern seaboard. They start down in Georgia, where they have peaches, and then they come up the seaboard, right? And all the ones that were coming in across Maine and New Brunswick, they were coming in over massive amount of PVY inoculum compared to the last few years because New Brunswick raised their capital at seven or eight percent, and Maine they were planting ten percent PVY stuff in Maine, so they came across a lot more inoculum than they could have. So you you could be almost guaranteed that some of those green peach aphids were carrying PVY, and that they were and that they're an infection source. So then that gets us to, okay, if that peak of, of green peach aphids is almost always end of August, 1st of September, you know, are we do we consider having our crop seed top crop top killed in advance of that flush to try and manage that? I saw Tyler McKenzie over at ACS did a little presentation at the New Brunswick conference there last Thursday. And he was able to show that there was a significant difference in PVY between the people that top killed the last week of August for the first week of September. It was a threefold difference in PVY. So yes, you're sacrificing some yield, but it may be a difference between having seed that you can replant and seed that you can't. So it's just something to consider. And so along with that, if we are gonna be moving to more earlier top killing, especially for the more susceptible varieties, then we have to look at, well, if we don't want to sacrifice as much yield, how do we manage that? So maybe that's planting earlier, uh, if, you're, if you feel you've got enough control on the earlier aphids. But it's also looking at your optimizing the nitrogen rate to get earlier tuberization and earlier bulking. Um, and that kind of leads into this work that we did on optimizing and reducing nitrogen rates. So I presented some of this at the meetings I did on fertility a couple weeks ago, but I want to dig into it just a little bit more. We've done a lot of trials on this over the last few years, and we basically saw over four years and 13 different trials that there was no difference in yield when you decreased your nitrogen by about 25 to 30% from what people had normally been doing from uh, in nitrogen. We did some trials this year. We did, as I said, we've been doing three or four trials a year for four years. Um, this year we did three more. So these two were up west. The grower's actual standard was 100 pounds, which is a lot lower than a lot of people do use for seed. Some people are in this range, but that's lower than a lot of people would use. Um, he went another 30% down and lowered it to 70. Planted late May mid to late May, top killed early September. Again, we saw no difference in yield, no difference in uh, in like size distribution really. We, interestingly also, we did not see a difference in residual nitrate. So I went in there at, when we did this yield harvest and I also took nitrate samples at those spots. And we didn't see a difference in residual nitrate between these two either. So it actually may be that for these varieties, the 100 pounds may be 
more appropriate, like, because we weren't, there wasn't a lot of wasted nitrogen. All I can tell you for sure is that, you know, probably the right rate is somewhere in this range. And I, you know, if the grower told me, you know, I'm good with 100 and that, and he's happy with the crop he's getting at 100, it's still a lot lower than a lot of people are using. Um, and, and there didn't seem to be that much, there wasn't an advantage to going to 70 in, in the, for these two varieties anyway, other than the, saving the cost of fertilizer. Um, if it's any help, we would put on about 55 pounds per acre yeah. nitrogen on all, all of our seed crops. Yeah. So 55 pounds an acre of nitrogen on seed crops, and you guys are getting what? You said you 35 tons per hectare on seed? 30, 35 tons, 30, yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. 300, 100 weight, you know? So that's pretty good seed crop. That's, you know, more than a lot of our seed crops would average. So. Um, we did see a slight trend on the targets towards reduced yield and tubers, but nothing that was significant. So as I said, the optimum is probably somewhere in that range. But when we did look at, we looked at East Prince here, we looked at Mountain Gems, and so the grower standard was 150, which would be a little bit higher. We went down 25%, which was 113 pounds. And we did see a significant, different, significant increase in yield at the lower nitrogen. So I know that only well, it's 1,400 weight, but our samples were so similar, like we had a lot of, like the, the range on them was very narrow, so we actually saw, um, we did see a significant difference here. And so uh, you're able to cut the nitrogen by 25%, and then we actually had uh, a little bit higher yield, and a little bit better size distribution. There was more tubers in the smaller size profile, so that you'd have to probably cut less or at least cut fewer of the big tubers and also interestingly when, when i went in and did that residual nitrate testing we had 50 percent more nitrogen left over in the gsp than in the low end which again makes sense there's more nitrogen that's just not needed that's just left over at the end of the season and these plants were still pretty rank green when we when they went into top kill them they weren't you know they were still pumping so that tells me probably even at 113 it may even be a bit higher than we need and there may be an option for decrease in it slightly. That's the, that's the chart that I showed a couple weeks ago, but for anybody that wasn't here, you know, that's 13 trials over four years. We get some dry years in there, we get some wet years in there. Basically, average them all out, there's no difference in yield between the high and the low rates uh, on seed. So, um, don't use nitrogen you don't need, not only because it's an excess cost of nitrogen, but even more importantly for seed, hopefully if you're getting that tuberization earlier, you're getting that bulking earlier, and maturity earlier, skin set earlier, you can afford to kill them earlier, which then hopefully helps you keep the virus levels down. Um, so that's a, as well as not sacrificing yield. We don't, the goal is, is be able to keep the virus low and not sacrifice the yield. So by you know, having them mature a little faster, hopefully you get the best of both worlds. That's generally what we saw in this trial. And you can see here, even like this one here, Alverstone's in 2022, yes, 2022 is a good year, but at 100 pounds an acre of nitrogen, we're at 400 hundredweight. At 80 pounds, we're at 395. You know, those are big yields on fairly low amounts of nitrogen. Russet Burbank's here, and this was 2022. Um, we're around 400 hundredweight with, you know, lower nitrogen than people would normally put on Burbank. So you can grow potatoes with lower rates of nitrogen, especially if you, there's some carryover nitrogen from, say, a legume crop or higher organic matter field or history of manure application. You know, you got to act, factor all those factors in when we're coming up with these nitrogen rates. Any questions on that? And those probably transfer more carbon credits going down the road. Likely to, yeah. If you can document that you cut your nitrogen on a certain amount of acres by 25%, and you've got less nitrogen being wasted or going into nitrous oxide or nitrates or whatever, yeah, there's probably going to be benefit to that as well. So what you're saying, we need to hold off doing this carbon credits? <laughs> no, because the baseline... No, if you start no, off here... If the baseline for most of these carbon credits is three to five years ago. So as long as it's a difference this next year from what you were doing three to five years ago, you can still claim it. 
So start this year. <laughs> Just keep trying to make good records. We should all be making good records of what we're doing going forward on some of these things. If you don't have records from three to five years ago, then you can just tell them that you, <laughs> what you were doing before. If there's oh, yeah. nothing that contradicts you, but um, but definitely, you know, keep good records as you make changes. Keep good records of it because it may be something that you can put into a carbon credit pro program or something like this. This is something you'll hear more about at the Potato Expo. Um, as as is going to be talking on the Friday at Potato Expo, but we started a project through AIM supported by the Department of Agriculture, as well as the New Brunswick Department of Agriculture. And we're using a robot, uh, or a, well, it's not really a robot, but it's an autonomous vehicle that's, that's got a guy with a joystick and that sort of thing at this point. But it's capturing images of plants as it's going down the row, and it's trying to, we're trying to train it to identify infected PBY plants and, non, and healthy, <coughs> PBY, healthy plants that don't have PBY, so that we can use it basically to replace rogers eventually. Can we do AI, artificial intelligence roguing of potatoes for PBY? Mary Kay helped us flag some plants on some commercial fields this year. They went over to Matresh and Tyler actually had a great, it just worked out great. They had a bunch of plants, plots set up where they, for another trial, they knew every plant in a plot, whether it had PBY or not. So they were able to say, okay, the plant, take all these images, these ones have PBY and these ones don't have PBY. They also went to Cavendish and did something similar. So they did field and plot scale. And they did about 80,000 plant images this year with this machine, with these cameras. And on the first year of data, they're about 75% accurate at the field scale of identifying. Once it got trained, then it gave it fresh images it never seen before. And it was about 75% accurate at saying which ones had PBY and which ones didn't. The first year data, that's pretty good. <laughs> because there'd be a lot of new rogers that wouldn't be 75% accurate, right? Um, as, it, as it gets more images, gets trained more, sees more diversity, that sort of thing, it will likely get better. Most of these types of AI, deep learning algorithms, they just take, as you throw more images at them, they get better and better and better. But um, there'll be more to say about this at the Potato Expo. This was actually, this was on CBC National News last week. Um, yep. How did they test the accuracy on a field scale? Did they, did they go through with the machine and then test all the plants they said had PBY? Yeah, so they went back. It, would, it looked at the ones that it would say pinpointed as having PBY, and then they went back and I believe tested those plants with the rapid test. Oh. Yeah. So again, the plan is, is to do a lot more of this here in the next little while. It's, it's never going to be 100%. It's never going to get to 100%. But it doesn't need to be 100%. Because how many, how many rogers would go through and be 100% good at picking out PBY? Like, you know? But it's just, you know, at what point do we get to the point where it's good enough and it's, do, and it's saving a lot of work and it's saving a lot of people hours and it's hard to get rogers in the we're, first place? We're going to be redundant. But it, but it, doesn't, it doesn't take the potatoes out yet. It identifies no. So the first iteration, the first iteration is identifying where those potatoes are, right? And so right now, right now it's it's dropping a GPS pin with RTK where an infected plant is. The next iteration will be likely spraying something on that plant so that a non-trained person could just go in, pull all the ones with pink paint on them, you know, like that'll be the next step. And then probably the third step when they bring it to actually to commercialization will be, can we build something that actually takes them out of the ground or something, right? Or zaps them enough at early stages or something. So that'll be the iteration of this. But right now it's, can we using AI accurately identify plants that are unhealthy and be able to do something with them? And I think this is pretty, this is pretty cool and pretty revolutionary. So come to the Potato Expo, and as I will have more to talk about that. CCAs, we get CCAs in the room. Um, that's your code for credits. I'll leave this up for a second so people can scan their code. Um, while we're doing this, uh, we, we do have sessions coming up the, after, the week after Potato Expo. So I think it's the 27th, 28th with um, 
Chad Berry from Manitoba. So Chad's going to come talk about reduced tillage in potato rotations, precision agriculture. Chad's been doing some cool stuff with Simplot out there where he sort of modified his planter to be able to go right into like a soybean or canola stubble without a tillage pass and just basically do one pass planting. So there's been a bit more <coughs> he's doing some interesting stuff like that, but also he's minimizing tillage in the rest of his rotation and he's uh, doing a bunch of different stuff. So I think, uh, I think it should be a very interesting presentation. So that's Chad. Um, so 27th here in Emerald um, and Fox Island and the 28th in Montague. Acknowledging our funding partners as always. So uh, the growers in the room, the growers that supply for Cavendish, the, to uh, the, the province of PEI, as well as Ad Canada through CAP funding, and then of course Cavendish Farms. Those are the main funders of, of AIM. And then I talked about Potato Expo, so uh, this is all available online and also available in the agronomy updates that I've been sending. Um, so the, the Thursday, which is the 22nd, there's sort of the United Day, so it's sort of replacing the, the United Seminar. So the first two presentations are from Victoria and Mark with the United that's going to be talking about, you know, the status of where the crop is in North America, prices, movement, crop update, that sort of thing. And then in the afternoon, or not after the break, we have uh, Lee Anderson from FCC. He's an economist with FCC. He's going to kind of give an overview of the ag economy and where things are at there. And then we're going to have a panel discussion on attracting and retaining employees in agriculture. And I know we're all pretty focused on human resources and labor and ag. So Krista Prescott is from uh, Green Diamond and Sally. Ripley is with uh, MC Consulting in Charlottetown as an HR professional. Lori Long from the Ag Sector Council is going to talk about some of the Ag Sector Council programs. So I would encourage you to come to this. Thursday nights, we're having a little bit of a fun pub night at the upstairs at the poorhouse at the Old Triangle. Anybody's invited. It's just basically show up and chat. So there's no agenda. There's no, there's, it's just if you want to stick around in town after being at the expo during the day, you can stick around and you buy your own drink, but we might have some munchies and stuff. I heard you were buying. No, I heard you were buying. <laughs> so we can stick around and have a few, you know, munchies, have a drink, and have a chat, and uh, just an excuse to get together. Nothing more than that, really. I'm inviting all the speakers there, so if there's a speaker you want to talk to or something. And then on the Friday, this is more the agronomy day. So the uh, first session is uh, Darren Gibson from Manitoba. He's going to be talking about sort of managing foliar fungicides. So we know last year was we were really worried about late blight and the conditions were right for late blight. And so if you're spraying fungicides 13, 14 times in a year, you know, you, you start running out of mancozeb applications and chlorophyllanil and, the, you know, the, the contact fungicides, right? So it's how do you mix in with the other products while still keeping on top of early blight and keeping on top of whether it's white mold or gray mold or some of the other issues. So. Darren's going to talk about that. Uh, Tracy Schinner Scarnelli is going to talk about insecticide resistance for Colorado potato beetles. Manitoba has kind of been the hot spot for resistance for, for for beetles the last number of years, and they have like they kind of the neonics just don't work for them at all anymore. Like we still get some use out of them, but it doesn't work for them. So she'll have a lot to talk about about how they're managing insecticides, how they're managing potato beetles. I have uh, Alex uh, Melnitschuk Mel from Alberta. He's a precision ag guru, and he's going to talk about sort of the, the low-hanging fruit of digital agriculture, how you can use data to your advantage uh, in uh, whether it's variable rate planting or variable rate uh, fer fertility or just managing your fields in, in a variable way. So he's going to talk about that. And then Adazaz uh, from EPEI is going to give an update on the projects that he's been doing with the board, with AIM, including the one I just talked about. Each of those sessions have uh, two and a half CEUs available for the CCAs. If you want to register, you can register now for free. That QR code or the link that went to your emails gets you free app, free registration. It'll be twenty dollars at the door, and it'll also, if you register in advance, it'll save you hassle from registration at the door. So. If it's free registration, just do it. <laughs> so uh, it'll be, you know, do it today um, and uh, save yourself the hassle. And if, if you do that, get asked for a promo code. There's a few different promo codes running around, but there's one in my emails as well. So, um, 
So that's me. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Thoughts on anything we talked about today? Additional questions you thought of for Sophie? Questions for me? Get back to the scene, Ryan. Yep. There's a spike in green peach. <coughs> Have you seen any post harvest results with, with the leaf roll? There isn't it hitting it? Not in PEI. Uh, Tyler said that they found green peach aphids with leaf roll that were positive for leaf roll at 12 places in Maine last year and in two places in New Brunswick. So if it's in Maine and New Brunswick, it's every chance it'll come here in the not too distant future, the way green peach aphids come. So something has to be on our radar. But so far in the post-harvest test results, there hasn't been any that I'm aware of. So. But we know that the green peach aphids are very good at transmitting uh, leaf roll. So. And the numbers you've seen in the last two years of green peach aphids, I've never seen those numbers before. Yeah. Like, like, the green, like numbers, they used to come in before we had admire, they used to come in and the populations did used to go up, but not to the levels we're seeing, we're seeing now. And it could be a cyclical thing, like you know, the big advantage with, 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 with the Aven Work program we have here in New Brunswick is they run them every year so we can see trends. Sometimes in the, in the states, they only run them when they have a problem, right? So they don't, they can't compare over the years. So that's been one big advantage of our program. They could be an El Nino thing or, you yeah. know, like it can be different weather but paths, it, but we but all it's know. it two years in a row. Yeah. Now our, our, as far as I understand, our post-harvest results are better this year. And I think people were more prepared yeah. in 2023 because of the high levels in 2022. So they did things different, like top to the procedure and, and did some different things. So we we'll just have to wait and see what, what the next year's like. But I think knowing it makes people a bit, a bit better prepared. Yeah. <coughs> and we got some of this information about the insecticide uh, resistance out. I got the first results in sort of June. So, it, you know, we did try and get it out to people a little earlier um, with what was going on, but I just got the full report here last month. So. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? I'm competing for airtime here. <laughs> You're both of you. Yeah. <laughs> You're both of you. I to compete with a one-year-old. Um, <laughs> If there's nothing else, folks, I really appreciate you coming. Uh, I really sincerely do. Uh, I know it's a busy time and it's been a busy week with all the snow and everything, so I appreciate you coming, especially when we go to the effort of bringing somebody across the ocean <laughs> to come and talk to you. I really appreciate you being here. So thank you very much. Uh, I did record this session today, so it'll be uh, available if there's something you want to rewatch it or there's someone at your firm that wanted to see it and couldn't be here today, it'll be available online as well. Um, so we, we do that with all of our sessions. So um, I think that's it for today. We'll get you out of here right. really early. One question. Uh, with the earlier kill down and see, where is this bit in the Any issues there? It's probably more than I can answer for you. Greg, I don't know that I had anybody telling me they saw a real big issue with Rhizoc this year. Usually we have more of the issue with Rhizoc in the dry years, but um, yeah. I, yeah, it's kind of the same as here. Yeah. See it here. Didn't, didn't, I, I see a bit of Rhizoc on the odd potato I buy at the grocery store this year, but, you know, it is what it is. I don't, I'm not hearing it being a massive issue, but, uh, surprisingly enough, like in that, uh, trial we did on the Minuet, and in Minuet's trial for, or his label for Rhizoc, we didn't see any better Rhizoc control with, with the Minuet, but, Perhaps the Quadris was already doing a decent enough job at keeping it down, right? So, yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much, everybody, and uh, we'll see you hopefully a lot of you at Potato Expo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.